Potter is connecting. What's up, John? There he is. What's going on? <laughs> we we are live right now, so we are recording. So uh, okay, we're, we're just uh, we're just giving you a heads up. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we've got uh, we've got Brian that uh, is going to jump in probably in a little bit. He's just in a previous meeting right now. And uh, we have Phil probably jumping in just on audio alone. And we're going to have okay. to rake him over the coals a little bit because he's actually hunting swamp donkeys right now. <laughs> Amazing. He's a real outdoorsman, that guy. <laughs> I yeah. think so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he sent wow. me a little video of him stalking them uh, in, in the bush yesterday. So. Oh, jeez. Oh, nice. <laughs> I know. Uh, He's channeling his uh, his inner bear grills, I think. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> How are you doing, Kev? I'm doing well, thanks. Yeah, we're um, just kind of getting ready for winter here in Whistler. So the last of kind of the fall recreation and then trending towards the, the snow stuff. Definitely. Any snow so uh, your way at all? Yeah, we've had snow up high, so say uh, 5,000 feet and above, kind of. Yeah. Um, so certainly at the ridge tops, it's looking pretty wintry, but it's actually about plus 10 in the valley today. Oh, okay. So it's, it still feels like fall. Yeah, it's uh, minus temperatures here for the last little bit. So we've got ice, uh, ice on the creeks. The lakes are wow. you know, obviously still open, but yeah, when I came home yesterday, all the all the little creeks and everything had a nice little thin layer of ice on them. Oh wow, so it's coming! It's coming. And how long? And when would the ice leave now, Rick? How long are you into it for? Uh, you know, it depends. I mean, we will probably once the ice comes in, it'll be May first till it's right. Yeah, May first, mid. You know, sometimes second week of May. Well, and it's a good thing that the ice is coming in because uh, Rick's got to get out there and clear Nav too, and he, and he doesn't want to swim. I know. Oh, so. wow. yeah. <laughs> I said I'd wait till the ice was in this year to go clear that course. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Skate over to that. Uh, yeah, they got checkpoint, a little checkpoint thirteen. If memory yeah, serves correct. That's right. Yeah, 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 that's right. Everybody remembers checkpoint thirteen. <laughs> That's right. That was so great. Yeah. If um, if we hadn't lost, uh, if the GoPro isn't at the bottom of the isn't at the bottom of the lake right now, there'd be some great footage of Fine Stone. Uh, oh, yeah. Just uh, the camera held right at water level of him swimming right to. Uh, we were kind of wondering what was actually on that GoPro. We haven't been able oh. to recover it yet. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're hoping for a springtime recovery i uh i, I it may be uh, one of those things that we'll have to like do a live update uh when they do actually surface with the gopro yeah. so that's right yeah it's gonna be like like uh, al capone's tomb kind of thing there exactly yeah. and right. then and uh, and if that if that media is still good by then we've got to alert the uh, gopro research and design team yeah no kidding yeah <laughs> Good job, boys. Definitely. <laughs> and girls. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we had a recovery team out there for a pretty long day. They they couldn't find it. They were keen on going again, but yeah. they ran out of steam after that first try. Yeah. 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 All right, well, we'll wait for a little bit for uh, the other guys. Maybe we'll see if they'll uh, pop on. But, yeah, how are things with you? Like, now that you guys have postponed things a little bit, what's uh, what's filling your plate there, Kevin? Well, um, yeah, so my work has kind of officially uh, tapered off as of last week on Eco Challenge. So we're completely on hiatus. Okay. Um, so right now I'm kind of in transition um, onto a couple of potential other projects and also enjoying a lot of family time because, right. as you can imagine, um, taking on an international multi sport event like that, it takes to you away from home a lot so um, I'm trying to look at the positive that with that game time at home it leaves me open to do some adventures with these two back there so oh, that yeah. that's awesome well I know yeah. that uh, in a bit you got to go because uh, one of your uh, one of your daughters has a luge practice <laughs> yes yeah so that's that, that's one of the unique uh, things about living in Whistler is 
of course, you live right next door to the uh, Vancouver 2010 sliding center. So, um, no kidding. So she's right now it's still dry land training, but she's on the um, does the development developmental program for British Columbia in Luge. So oh, she cool. slides um, at least twice and usually three times a week. That's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. When, when you first said that to me or whatever, I just got this like image or whatever of, of you kind of like a, a Dr. Evil, because we get that all the time as mm -hmm. race directors with that Dr. Evil thing. And there's that one scene where he's saying, the details of my childhood are quite inconsequential. <laughs> Learning how to luge in Rangoon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I've had, um, you know, in, um, definitely been responsible for doing a lot of crazy things, adventures with those two. But this luge, you know, I have no background in sliding sports or anything. And Ella uh, really um, gravitated towards it totally herself. That's awesome. So um, it's nice to have a little bit of uh, the distance between, you know, I have no expertise in it at all. I can't help her other than yeah. drop her off. And so it's nice to have that she's got her own thing, her own passion, and yeah. she can just take it and run with it, you know. Right. Just You can be a spectator there for a while. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's a funny story that I, um, we signed Ella up for the, the luge program when my wife Meredith was out of town. And the day she got back to town, we went to pick her up at the sliding center and she sees Ella go around the, you know, the famous Finnish corner of Whistler sliding center with the big Whistler logo up in the ice. Oh my and gosh. Meredith looks over at me and goes, are you insane? Yeah. <laughs> As she goes by at 85 kilometers per hour. Yeah. yeah. And and me, meanwhile, Ella probably got up at, the, at the end of it and just jumped up and like, Woohoo, that was awesome. Exactly. You know, she will routinely, you know, she's 10 now, but last season as a nine-year-old, she would routinely go um, over 100 kilometers an hour. And you'd watch her uh, go by and it's just completely calm, you know, it's oh. just amazing. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, that incredible. <laughs> I know. And the way I always describe that speed is that, you know, I would have my vehicle impounded if I drove home from the sliding center at that speed. So <laughs> that's right. That's, that's some right. perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think about myself trying that or whatever, and all you'd hear is just, ah! <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly. flying by>. <laughs> Echoing. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I, I think uh, like the big question, and we'll talk to the other guys about this as well too, um, is uh, is what what's happening with Team Where's Bear from now on? Like you guys have kind of established yourselves and uh, and set the bar, I think, really. Oh, that's good. That's fun. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> well, we, uh, you know, we're. Um, we're now constantly talking about which races make sense. You know, yeah. we've got a very, very nice invite from Jason Magnus that, with yeah. Bend I Racing, who does um, Expedition Oregon, of course, among other races. Right. Um, but that's his main event every year. So we're trying to decide whether, I mean, without the luxury of a crystal ball, we don't know whether we'll choose to travel to the U.S. in right in spring right that's in may isn't it it is yeah right. yeah um so um yeah so i'm not sure uh brian um and i as well as well as scott flavel whom i know you haven't met but he's a big part of our race right. management team as a technical director for race exactly the three of us went and, and participated in the um the um a, a row game with the um, Greater Vancouver Orienteering Club yesterday. Oh, so cool. it was a six-hour cutoff. Oh, nice. Super fun. Get as many checkpoints as you can. Right. Um, so Finestone and I kind of did it as a team, and Flavel and his wife did it as a team. Um, so it was really, it was really amazing, and um, you know, it was a community event. Um, but forty checkpoints. You guys will understand how. 
much would have gone into setting up 40 checkpoints. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. In exactly the right place yeah. in the back country. And then you do it and the entry fee is $15. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. pretty amazing. Uh, so, yeah, so we, um, Feinstein and I got in it, uh, did it. We didn't, I don't think any, I could be wrong, but I don't think anybody got all the checkpoints. But yeah. there's, you know, there's a serious penalty for being taking longer than six hours. So right. we got back after five hours and 58 uh, minutes. So nice. we snuck in there. <laughs> we didn't get, we were, almost got greedy at the end, but um, it was really Feinstone's cool thinking <laughs> that said, no, we shouldn't. So. <laughs> yeah, we, we run into that often at Swamp Donkey. So, yeah. Oh, they took out one more checkpoint. One more I checkpoint. know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But... And and coming in just two minutes under the time limit or whatever, like we literally had teams this year, same thing. They came in just a moment under the the time limit. Oh and yeah. I think we I think we only had two teams this year that came in past the time limit. So Oh amazing. I can't remember. Do you do a time penalty or is that a kind of a DQ? We it's not a DQ, but we do yeah. unrank them. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they still get all of their checkpoints. Oh, there we go. We got uh, Mr. Finestone coming in. Yeah. And I think hey, we uh, we almost yeah. have uh, Kevin. Only has a few more minutes left with us here. Yeah. So well, the Finestone's going to have to take over. <laughs> um, yeah, that's interesting. You got to incentivize people to finish on time, so you don't. Yeah. get into the dark hours and yeah like we that. we had a couple of races early on where you know teams were finishing at 8 8 30 yeah and uh once we once we had that we changed the format so it was a yeah. hard cut off at six o'clock we're still going to list all your times and when you finish but yeah not, so if you want to be competitive and you want to finish in a yeah. ranking, you've got to be back before six o'clock it's a hard hard yeah cut off yeah the la last thing that we want to do uh, which we had to do before is send in the search and rescue team yeah. at night in the dark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody's eating, wanting to eat their food and drink beer. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yeah. And, and yeah. the search and rescue team usually consists of Rick, Alex, and I. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> looking, looking for a team that has no tracker. Yeah. Or, yeah. or teams that are back at their cabin drinking beer and forgot. Oh, and didn't. They, oh, the yeah. Course. Yeah. And didn't let us know that they had gotten back. Gotten back yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a classic. Yeah, yeah, that exactly. <laughs> so I think uh, we've got Brian trying to get in here. Do we have audio for Brian? Or I think I'm in. Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear you. We can't see you. Is that? Uh... Uh, I've got the worst Wi-Fi connection left on planet Earth. Like <laughs> it's brick. so. Like go video. You, it'll just be this glitchy yeah. mess. So I'm better just to be a radio broadcaster. Okay. Oh, there you go. <laughs> You've got a face for radio, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> My mom always said. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Brian, Kevin was just telling us that you guys uh, participated in a, in a road game the other day and did, uh, did quite well, so... We did, and, and my, my latest uh, sweep through the website told me that we are 13th overall as far as uh, time and points. And I am third place in my age category, and Kevin is first place in his age category. Wow, congratulations, guys. Oh, that's that's awesome. awesome. That really, it just means I'm old. <laughs> that's, all that, that's all that means. Hey, eventually you get to that stage or whatever, and it's like, yeah, I feared masters, but now it's okay. I know. I know. That's what I figure. You know, I'm just going to. I'm going to hold out for a little bit. And as soon as I start getting old, I'll go out there and start winning races. In yeah. My age category. <laughs> look at, look at the title of the book I'm reading right now. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Ah, yeah, there you go. There you yeah. go. <laughs> and I actually highly recommended. And All if right. anybody's looking for some good tips, you know, <laughs> I'll have to look up that one right away up after this zoom call. That's what yes. Sure <laughs> it's written by that Joe Friel, who's uh, with oh, right. the author of all the training Bibles. The other okay. one on that on the topic too is not on the aging topic, but on the um, outdoor athlete topic is the um, uphill athlete, a training for the uphill athlete. Okay. It's by Killian Jornet, and I'm just I'll just show you the, the oh, yeah. cover here. I don't I don't know if I'm way off topic for you guys. But. Oh no no, Killian's a freaking beast. I know all about Killian. So. so 
that book Scott, is Steve Powell's and Scott Johnson. It's um, it's by Patagonia Books, okay. Um, okay. so it's pretty easy yeah. to find. Really great. It's kind of become one of my uh, main go tos. And I, I borrowed it from Kevin, read it, and then I, I went out and bought him a replacement copy because I already folded pages and spilled coffee all over <laughs> yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Highlighter. And <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, uh, Brian, we were talking with Kev there, and uh, like the, the big question I think on everybody's minds are Will Where's Bear be back for Swamp Donkey 2021 to defend their title? <laughs> I, I have a strong feeling that they'll be back, but there's going to be a, a bit of a name change in the uh, the name of the uh, team. Uh, are, are you going to hint at what's going on here, or is this something that you're going to drop on us just before? No, no, it's it will be publicized in advance. Um, <laughs> we're, we're now officially known as Team Eco AR. Oh, oh, wow. good job. Okay. <laughs> We are officially now entered in Expedition Canada. As oh, team. really? Oh, you are. Okay. Yeah. Well, that right. that yeah. that that opens up another uh, <laughs> another question here because we haven't actually announced it, but uh, Rick and I are entered as well in Expedition Canada. So we'll be racing against awesome. Team Eco <laughs> AR. <laughs> I love All right. it. There we go. I would, and I and John, I wasn't uh, holding out on you. That's just news to me that it was confirmed. Yeah, right Brian, now. Okay. Right now. <laughs> yeah. That's the call that we were on for. We that was the call that I, we, I couldn't meet you guys at three thirty. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm gonna need more of the training tips there from you guys before, <laughs> especially the whole uh, running in the mountains, because you know it's not exactly hilly here. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I have to wait till the 70 kilometer an hour wind comes so that I can go run into the wind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. right. Into the wind. I should, I should run guys. I got to deliver my daughter to her. Have years. fun at Luge. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks Thank a you lot, guys. Kevin. Well, Pleasure. Yeah. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. All right. Yeah. All right. So we got Brian now. Uh, we are recording this too, Brian. So just to let you know, and um, yeah, so uh, Kev kind of gave us a little, uh, a little bit of a uh, tidbit of information as to what could have been on that GoPro when we were talking about uh, checkpoint 13 and, and doing the swim across. Um, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Well, uh, it was me. Uh, I, yeah, I know. <laughs> I volunteered, and there wasn't even a short stick. I, I volunteered. I knew that I was the weakest link on the team and that I had to do something to pull my weight. So uh, I said I would do it. I, I, I didn't go full naked. I, um, I thought about it for a minute, and then I realized that I would just be putting on cold, sweaty clothes anyway. So right. <laughs> I, I, I went for it. I jumped in. I kind of tried to do the like, pool player math and decide which – angle to come at it from there's some guys uh jumping in a little bit kind of you know to the left i guess that would be to the west of of where i jumped in uh, right. that looked like a longer swim and i wanted to minimize the time in the water so i jumped in kind of on the eastern shortest point uh swam out to the it was like floating raft is what it felt like the whole thing moved when you got onto it yeah and i, and I knew it was one of those uh, I was going to take the breath away. It was going to be go out there, get the, the control point, and then get back, you know, before you warm up because it's not worth trying to warm up on the raft or you won't want to get back into the swampy water. So, you know, I, it was awesome. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't the only swim that I took uh, that day. <laughs> but it was the, uh, the first one and the more predictable one. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so, yeah, what did happen there for that capsize, just for those who don't know? So, so yeah, we... We pulled out from the little rocky bay and there was a bunch of boats in the water and people cheering and we were all excited for the, the kind of home stretch to the finish line. And I, I think it was Kevin who yelled, how many teams are ahead of us or in front of us? And somebody said, nobody, you're in first. <laughs> so That's awesome that you guys did As know. a result, <laughs> we fist pumped and we were like swinging our paddles in the air and, and Phil went to do a fist pump and the GoPro had been hooked onto his PFD just as in a quick transition to get into the boat and he bumped it with his fist and it went over the gunnel into the water and his natural reaction was to lunge over to get it and in that uh super tippy boat 
Uh, what happened was it didn't take much for the biggest guy in the boat leaning over the side for everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we, uh, we all went in, everything floated everywhere. You know, we had, had made the smart decision to make sure everything was attached, that, you okay. know, attach your vest, attach, you know, your water bottle, whatever, and then got on the boat and didn't do it. So instantly everything <laughs> to float away, gloves, hats, oh. vests, the yeah. map, you know, kind of everything. So uh those guys like phil was kind of uh grabbing paddles and hanging onto the boat kev tried to right the boat and get in and of course our paddling or our bailing device what we brought was a 250 milliliter water bottle cut in half so that was <laughs> <laughs> i heard about that from some of the people on the oh, boat yeah. that they were like yeah they were trying to bail with this little yeah. teeny tiny you know what? <laughs> I had spent like I had spent a couple of hours at that nav two spot, and I literally had just left to go to the finish line, and then I hear on the radio that these you guys are in the water. I'm like, what? How did I miss that? Uh, it, it was yeah, it was awesome. It was as you couldn't write a better script. You know? yeah, no, 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 no kidding. <laughs> it and so you guys managed. You just went back to shore, hey? Yeah. So we sort of first it was quick, flip it over, bail it out, and that clearly wasn't going to work. So it was like, okay we're going to swim back to shore. There's no other way you can't, right. you know, there's no way we could do like a swimming rescue where you'll kind of do like sculling paddle stroke and lift it over your head to dump the water out and then get in. It's just too tippy a boat to yep. try and do a water start in. So we just cut our losses and swam it back. And I think probably the whole exercise took 20, 25 minutes to okay. dump the thing over, swim oh, wow. it back, you know, get back inside of it and then very cautiously paddle back out from there. Right. <laughs> yeah. So at that point, did you uh, start to see teams uh, that were uh, sort of hot on your heels, so to speak? No, we didn't see anybody. And oh, okay. once we got back, I think there was a, I don't remember what the gap was, but I think it was 20 plus minutes before the, mm. the next team came. So yeah, this is about 20 minutes. Yeah. yeah, we didn't see them behind us at all. And, and so... I think I mean, we were pretty cold and, and I actually started to shiver after we kind of came across the finish line, took a couple of photos. So we actually ran back to our, our cabin and got changed and then came back down to the finish line to watch everybody else come in. Mm -hmm. So right. we never did get a chance to congratulate those guys that came in second. And, and I think I would like to take my hat off to them, a group of, of young guys like that with that yeah. kind of skill yeah. set. Amazing. It's such a cool thing. And those guys are going to be a force majeure in the future if they keep it up. No, I agree. Yeah, I'm just looking at the I'm looking at the top ten teams here, and it's a it's a mix of men's teams, co-eds teams, and the uh, Thunder Bay Babes women's team uh, sitting in the top ten. And honestly, like all of those teams were just you know super super strong. And um, yeah, if you look, you guys did have uh, you know a pretty significant lead just into the finish there, but uh, you know within the next top in nine or 10 teams, it was very, very tight. Oh, they were coming one after another. It was amazing to watch yeah. and to cheer them on. And you know what I think struck me also interesting was how, I mean, it was a one day. It's not like people were destroyed like they would be in an eco challenge, mm -hmm. but the positive, like even people that you could see were struggling or suffering or slightly lost or whatever. Everybody was smiling. Everybody was figuring out what it was. Nobody, mm -hmm. I, I didn't see anybody quit. I didn't see anybody really arguing with their teammates if they were it was in jest it was it was so yeah. cool what a great yeah team. and i as race directors too i mean you guys probably know this but i mean this is what you know what keeps you going so i mean for us the motivation to keep putting these races on is to see people challenge themselves and then you know just have a have a ball with it and you know it is there is um you know some years have been pretty pretty hard um you know and there's always points in a race where anybody can struggle even in not even in an eight or a nine hour race and you know, just that positivity is so invigorating for us as race directors. Yeah, not everybody can be positive the whole time. It, no, it's interesting. Exactly. It's kind of like whack-a-mole. There's always somebody yeah. who's up while everyone else is down. And then when yeah. that person goes down, somebody else pops up. And that, that's one of the amazing things about adventure racing. But I, I really don't know much about it. If you recall, before I was a Swamp Donkey uh, graduate, I had yeah. never done a, a, a true adventure race with a yeah. team. I'd done solo one-day multi-sport events, but never the teamwork aspect. And, mm. and I, it was awesome. I, I can't tell people how great it is and how they need to go out and try one. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I think that's the, the word that pops into mind is resilience, right? Because you have yeah. the hard, hard times, but you do bounce back fast and just move on and, and uh, just keep plugging away at it. No, that's yeah, awesome. I, so yeah, you, guys, you guys raced together the first time as a team. And I mean, you know each other, all, obviously, but was there anything in the race that you sort of learned about each other for, you know, for future races as a team? 
Well, I think what I learned was uh, in the photos, because you don't really pay attention, and then you look back at the photos, um, Kevin sat down. There's that one picture where he's sitting down and I'm holding the map, and I have no recollection of that moment. I, didn't, I don't even remember holding the map once, because those guys <laughs> yeah. are like, navigators and I'm not. Yeah. So you know, somehow I was the navigator for a split second. Kevin was sitting down, which hasn't happened ever in his life. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you comment on that. It's like I was holding the map at some point uh, <laughs> and I have like an actual photographic <laughs> evidence of it, yet I don't remember ever having the map in my hand. So. I certainly didn't make very many navigational decisions. I was, I was the hype man. That was my job. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, guys, you guys moved pretty fast through that second nav. How did you find that? with no features. I mean, Kevin mentioned this to me a little bit afterwards, but I mean, it's just bush and river and handrails and stuff. There's no mountains to navigate by. So how, how do you feel about that? You know, we used kind of a, we handrailed with shaped features. So some of the, the you know, marshlands or tree lines had certain shape to it. The power lines above would kind of give you a, a little bit of a handrail. And then I got to say that that was, Phil had the map at that point. He was our navigator. And that was, Phil absolutely smashing a perfect navigation run. That's really what that one boiled down to. Yeah. And then us being there to run confidence for him. And then, you know, he would be like, it's gotta be, you know, out there and around here somewhere. And then we would fan out and do almost like a SAR style right. uh, look for the, the control point. And mm -hmm. that's generally how we would find it. Yeah, but we, were, we, would, we would definitely, uh, someone who, like whoever had the map, we were feeding them, we were encouraging them, we were, making sure that they didn't have other things to to worry about and i think that is a strategy that we're going to take into bigger longer races and it's actually the, kind of what we do often when we're setting up and testing things out on the eco challenge there'll be one or two people on the map and other people are looking at landmarks looking at where could you camp where could you set up you mm -hmm. know safety where could you have a um you know heli spots because we've all got different jobs within the the eco challenge race management and so often Scott, who, who's in charge of all the helicopter stuff, is always thinking of the mountain rescue heli aspect of it. You know, I may be thinking of transitions and how are we going to move all the equipment in here to, you know, have people change over from running to bike to, or paddle to bike or whatever. And those decisions, while you're out there testing the course, not everybody can be doing everything. And it's really good to divide and conquer that, in, that information. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that, um, you know, quite a few quite a few times a lot of people ask us that this question uh, Brian like as a navigator are you at the front or the back and I think you know you guys I think you had mentioned um, to me that you uh, did not have the navigator at the front correct yeah it would it would change so, it would sometimes change? Okay. the navigator would be on point and other times especially for that second nav section which was more difficult we might shoot a bearing and then often what we do in that case is we fan out in a straight line and we and we kind of run like a big long compass needle mm -hmm. so right. navigators in the middle you have somebody who's like yeah you're on bearing on bearing and then if we have to do a back bearing the other person is the same distance behind uh so if they have to run interference and go backwards to a known point they can they can shoot off of that guy that's behind mm -hmm. so, so that's that's sort of how we tackle it and that's how yep. we do it in real life out there in you know in patagonia and that's what we did in the race and it yeah, was for sure. effective for us yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you've got, you know, you've got three people in this case on a team. So, you know, each person uh, can take the role and, and stay engaged in all aspects of the race. And that way, I think, too, it's, you know, the, sometimes it's, um, I hear oftentimes that the navigator has a, a, you know, a very important role. But I think some of the other you know, teammates often forget that they're, you know, they can be there to support the navigator. And it's not just their, you know, it's not just their role to to get it right, but somebody can always you know, watch for features and maybe counting time or paces or that, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and Absolutely. I think like what you said too, Brian, or whatever, that uh, one person was uh, making sure that everybody was getting fed, everybody had water, and just reminding people because sometimes you just get so sort of in that race mode that you don't even think about that stuff. And as long as somebody else sort of has your back and you at that point or whatever, you just want to be concentrating on the navigation and you don't want to have to even think about like what time it is, like uh, how many more checkpoints do we have to get? You just want to sort of be in the moment right where you are right there. Mm -hmm. that's, that's exactly how, how we tackled it. We would, we would do that. So it would be somebody pulls out a power bar and hands off 
you know, it's like, here, take a bite. First bite goes to the navigator and then you continue eating. Have you, you know, everyone drinks. So everybody drinks. And it's like almost a cadence. So somebody yeah. on that food and nutrition, because if, if you don't go until you're thirsty or you don't go until you're hungry, you're doing constant maintenance of that stuff. So it never rears its ugly head. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't pop up that someone's bonking or starving. You just keep, and that doesn't matter whether it's a one day race or whether it's a big long mountain bike ride, whatever it is to be in that same mode where you're, where you're looking out for the decision makers or the weakest link or, or whatever is going on. And, and I think that one of the other pieces in adventure racing, people think, oh, you just have to be crazy fit or crazy smart navigator, no. Alex Mann person. Well, the reality <laughs> is you can, you can be, you know, the most mediocre fit person who's a great navigator who loves to just be out there, who's positive and upbeat, and you'll make a great team member. You don't necessarily need to be yeah. an ultra marathon runner. And, and I think that's, that's a barrier of perception that I hope on the Eco Challenge show was, was destroyed because you saw there was families, there was oh, yeah. people that, you know, military people that had yeah. come back from injury. Like you had all these different characters out there. And what that really shows me is that the AR community is open to everybody and all you have to do is go out there and, and put your put yourself out there, put your heart on the line, and you will be accepted. You will be lifted up. You will be brought along, and and that's a pretty cool thing. That's that's yeah. happen your sport. <laughs> I think I saw a, a comment on the uh, discussion board there. Somebody asked, "Why don't adventure racers look like American Ninja Warriors?" I don't know if you saw that, but it was funny, the comments. It's like, well, we all have jobs or, you know, it, it's, there's, um, you don't have to be a super athlete to, you know, join into adventure racing. And, well, that, all that muscle takes a lot of oxygen to, to keep it going and functioning. For sure. yeah. You know? yeah. And on the other, I don't know if, if you talked about cramping with anybody else. No, we didn't. Yet. We suffered massive cramping on that second nav section. When we got out of, we got into the canoe, we we're cramping. It was really hard to get your legs in a position where they didn't want to cramp up. Mm -hmm. And then when we got out of the canoe, we fired up off the trail on the first nav point and both Phil and I froze up like the tin woodsman with cramping legs. Yeah. And it took us a couple minutes to get those moving again. And I know that at the um, finish line and when we were all sort of eating spaced out in the park there, I heard a lot of other people discussing the same thing. And, and yep. The, it doesn't matter how fit you are. You like probably going to cramp up even more if you have, you mm -hmm. know, lean muscle like that and it's not getting the oxygen that it needs. It, yep. It's amazing. And that was, I never experienced that before in my life. Yeah. I think the, the interesting thing with doing Swamp Donkey for 14 years, Brian, is that, you know, we have, um, we have this ability to see a lot of the same teams come back year, year over year. Right. And as race directors, it's been fascinating to actually watch how they learn. And, you know, even in this, uh, I'm just have the top 10 list in front of me, but I'm sure there's a ton more in there. And all of those teams, I can tell you so many different things that they've learned, you know, through the years about what you had mentioned, nutrition and, you know, pacing and navigating and cramping and that kind of thing. So it's an interesting, it's almost an interesting experience to watch these teams um, and see how they've learned. And now, uh, you know, compared to their first year, just the experience that they've gained by just coming back and learning and trying it again year after year. Yeah, I think that like every time you go out, whether it's a training exercise, uh, whether you're just out recreating with a group of, of your friends, you learn something. And I think the key piece is that you gotta look at it as you're building your Swiss army knife. You don't, you don't have the perfect one already and you're adding tools to it. You're refining the tools that are on it so that maybe it can be something as simple as when we took the canoe out the very first time that you guys loaned us, we had no idea. We'd never paddled a, a canoe that's that speed efficient before. And we almost dumped it like on our third paddle stroke just because it had it was so tippy. So we had to adapt our paddling style to the boat that we had. And then it was, okay, how this thing, it wants to go fast in a straight line. So we adopted a Fijian paddling technique where you do X number of strokes on one side, you call a switch, you do three hard paddle strokes, you switch over to the other side, you do three hard paddle strokes on the other side, and then you go back into your paddling cadence. So that was taking you know, a Swiss army knife tool that we developed in another situation, applying it to this new race situation and finding out that it was beneficial and that it worked. And I think that's really what it is. It's about collecting all this knowledge and observing other people's techniques and experiences and, and trying them. And if they work, then adopting them, which is, 
again, in squash, you don't do that. In squash, you learn your forehand, you learn your backhand, and then you play squash. Mm -hmm. And you just get better and faster at it. Whereas this is like this amazing scavenger hunt of skills and techniques, which I think is, is so rewarding. Because every time yeah. you get a new one, you feel, you know, engaged and want to go and try it out again. Yeah. Well, and, and we, uh, we like saw you guys after you uh, had that first initial paddle the day before, and that was your first time in that boat. So that's new equipment to you as well, too. It was the first time paddling as a team. So you guys even had to try and figure out uh, who's going to sit in the front, who's going to like steer in the back, who's going to be in the middle. And uh, I think that we also had, uh, had given you a couple different options of paddles and things like that. So like you were saying, it's a, it's a learning experience with the type of equipment, but it's also a learning experience with uh, the team as well too, because, and we've seen this over the years with Swamp Donkey, we've been doing this for 14 years now. Sometimes it's not always the same team member on those returning teams either. Yeah, I could, I could totally see that. Yeah. The, the interesting, like it comes down to every little nuance, like carrying the canoe from where it stayed down to the water. Who's doing that? How are you doing it? Who's carrying it from where? And you can see people that haven't thought of that or programmed that in their minds, um, figuring it out on the fly on, during the race. Right. When we took that boat down to do our test, we realized very quickly it's very light. It's, a, it's set up for a one person carry portage. So just get out of the way. So what, what we did was <laughs> Phil, who's, who is, has the most canoeing experience, was going to be the portage guy. So he threw the boat over his head and shoulders. He takes right. off. Somebody's in front of him warning him of trip hazard, overhead hazard, you know, carrying the PFDs, carrying, you know, the paddles. And then someone's in the back picking up anything that gets dropped or knocked over or whatever and is, you know, also guiding if need be. And, it, and then we had a... a, a a situation plan for, okay, let's say we have to climb over a fence. How are we going to do it? Well, the guy in the front and the back are going to grab, you know, the, the, the bow and the stern. They're going to lift it off of his shoulders. He's going to run around. We're going to pass it over the fence to him because we didn't know if we'd be portaging or moving that boat from lake to lake or through like river systems. So right. we kind of decided to come up with a plan for all of it. And the, each of those things makes you more efficient because so much time is lost in transitions and in, in exactly. fumbling around doing that other stuff. And really, <laughs> like whether you're a team that's aspiring to win an event like Swamp Donkey, or whether you're a team that's just out there to do it every year and, and see if you can beat your buddies from the softball league, it, you know, you can beat them by coming up with those strategies and those plans. And by doing the weekend before Swamp Donkey, get out there to the white shells, get in your boat, practice how you're going to beach it, how you're going to carry it, how you're going to attach your stuff onto it or not. Like all those little things will make you more efficient, make you faster and a, and a better racer at whatever level you want to be at. All right. Well, my, uh, our, my goal for next year is uh, to keep you guys on the course for at least an extra hour. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we get a one hour head start. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and definitely throw, uh, throw a few more, uh, a few more type, types of different things that we've had over the years. Like the, the uh, year that we actually did the start where we came in on a helicopter, which was kind of the impetus to, uh, to you guys uh, finding out about the race as well, too. Um, we actually made them portage their canoes for, what, 3.4 kilometers yep. right, right off the hop. That's great. I love that stuff. Where Yeah, you know, totally. So like you're saying, Brian, having that plan for everything is, is perfect because, you know, next year we'll be in the same area, but we will have a completely different course again. So no, that, that's learning right. that and gaining that experience and just adding it all to your, your uh, skill set is, is exactly what you need. You know, there, there's a race called the Barkley Marathon, which is a running, ultra running race. People may have heard of it. There's a documentary about it, but the, the, the team that runs that they throw so many wrenches out there where the start can be anywhere in the 24 hours of the day that it's supposed to start on. So you may start at 8 a.m. You may start at one o'clock in the morning. You may start That's like, you, know, you just show up and you have a 24 hour window of when it may start. And I just think things like that, which make you make it unpredictable, which is what an expedition is, whether it's a one day expedition or, you know, a 10 day expedition that 
your every all these canoes are on this beach but guess what pick them up we're going to this other lake and you got to yeah. go the other direction 180 degrees i love that stuff <laughs> or the yeah you rode your bike to here but guess what you're going to put all your bikes in your canoe with you and you're going to ride it to the other yeah. side of the lake and yeah. start riding it. Yeah, I think things like that. I can't wait to, for you guys to do that. Make me yeah. swim over my head. I'm I'm so down. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, we got lots of ideas, lots of ideas going here. So, well, guys, I I could do this all night. And Brian, oh, that was amazing. Like, I love to hear your experience there from uh, from your team. Um, I got to get going, and um, so maybe we'll just wrap and wrap this up for now. But yeah, I love to hear your experience, Brian. I think a lot of our racers will as well, because you know we had about third of the about a third of the teams were new this year so we do hope that they come back and uh you know there's a lot to learn and debrief from from each race and but yeah i think the experience and just learning and if you if they do come back they will get that much better each time absolutely and i don't know if it's something that's within your wheelhouse but having a lot of people that i talked to that were volunteers were like i would love to do this but i don't know enough about x or y or whatever Mm -hmm. and if you could do a one-day clinic sometime leading up to the event i think you get a lot of people out that would be interested in trying you know if it's like almost like a guided one day you're going to paddle a bit you're going to do a little orienteering through some trails you're going to get on bikes and there's some coaching of of what you would do and then how to do a transition i think a lot of those people that were super keen volunteers that want to try it would come out try it and then you would have another whole generation of people that would be keen to get in the race and do it for the next decade yeah exactly. exactly so you guys yeah. keep keep at it with your thing on eco because i mean it was just huge motivation for a lot of people and um you know we'll we'll do our part here locally just keep growing that sport and i think it's just it's positive things for the future yeah <laughs> unfo- unfortunately i uh i don't think that uh we're gonna get uh phil on the call today he's actually out in the bush right now hunting swamp donkeys so we were gonna give him a little uh a little bit of the gears on that because uh swamp donkeys are kind of uh near and dear to our our hearts but uh he's he's an adventure guy and that's that's what he does but uh hopefully we'll get him back uh on the uh on the next call yeah. 